study this morning with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, on Sunday mornings we come to worship you in your house. And for thousands of years you've made a house of worship for you. Help us today as we see the ways people worshiped you and how they worshiped you with their hearts. As Solomon gets together to build this temple. Grow in us an appreciation for your house, a deep reverence for what you give us each and every day, and a thankfulness that whether we have a, a majestic house of worship or a simple one, it is a house where you dwell and a house where we praise you. Your son's name we pray. Amen. Our introduction this morning is uh, something personal for me. Uh, perhaps useful to you. I've, I've served as a call worker as either pastor or vicar at four different congregations. And the previous three, all of them had building projects. All of them added on to or renovated to their current facility while I was there. And uh, building projects are famous for a couple of things. Uh, they give pastors gray hair. <laughs> I thought that was children. Uh, and number two, building projects have a way of fomenting division. Because there's a price, right? Oh, we should pay that much. We should pay more. There's a design. Oh, that, that's way too gaudy. Well, oh, that's kind of simple. We need something better. The inconvenience of project timeline is simple. I, I've got the three previous churches, the membership and the cost. I want you to guess, listed, which one of those three projects was the most divisive and why? Faith Lutheran in Atlanta, 350 members, a $70,000 edition. Pilgrim Lutheran in Milwaukee, 500 members, a $400,000 edition. St. Paul's Lutheran in Menominee, 850 members, a $2.5 million edition and renovation. Which one was the most divisive?
Two and a half million dollars is a lot of money. The church we're looking at today cost a billion dollars. It's a B. And that's a conservative estimate at the cost of Solomon's temple. A billion dollars. Now we build billion dollar football stadiums. We build billion dollar basketball arenas. But a billion dollar church thousands of years ago? Can you imagine that, guys? Can you imagine? And we're going to look at this in a moment. Can you imagine the comments people would have said on a billion dollars? Send it to missions. We should do something else. Is this going to outweigh the benefits? Can, can you imagine the comments that people would say on the use of a billion dollars? Today we're looking at the building of Solomon's temple, and Christians don't always agree and disagree on that. But when you build a church, and here's my point today, a church is often a reflection of what your heart wants most. The way that you design, the way that you build, the, the things you put into it, is a reflection of what people want the most. Do they want to give God the best? Or the least? Do they want to put the money in their own home? Not the church. We think about building this church, understand, it's a great reflection on their hearts. And I think a little bit on ours. Any comments or questions before we get started on this temple building project? Bill? This is kind of a downer, but uh, uh, I think you have to go with a bit more gave of common sense also. It's because you want something that doesn't mean you can have. You know, it's like uh, like anything in life that you want a new car or something like that. It's like just it's it's a want, okay? But like a church you're looking at, uh, you've got to remember that you aren't the only one putting money into it, and so you're you're also looking at somebody else's money. And if they decide not to come or not to quit the church or do whatever they do, you're you're stuck with the bill. You know, and it's not, and that that is overwhelming sometimes if you go into something major, huge. A billion dollars, yeah. for example, right? Yeah. Maybe he had the money, you know, because he could probably put the bill. And I think that's going to be interesting. You know, we're looking at David and Solomon, and it's really interesting to me where the billions come from. And God actually recounts it. It's not just a couple of wealthy guys. There's one thing to say we need a billion dollar church. Another thing to say, who is good? Who is is the average guy going to give to a church that has gold everywhere, that has gold on top of gold on top of gold, that you walk on golden steps, you eat of golden goblets? Um, is that really necessary? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a really critical question. What does the average guy think of a really valid church? Luke, one more thought. It's always that balance between, between, between what do you need and what do you want. I mean, figure that out. And yeah, a lot of people. Right. A cost benefit analysis, like you're doing business. It's a billion dollar church, a cost benefit analysis. <laughs> in, a, in a way, what we're going to read goes against pretty much every American business concept. And my point in bringing this story up, it, well, I guess it's my opinion, you could disagree. My point of bringing up the story is this goes against every business concept. This is entirely faith here. I think sometimes in a church and a building and a concept, we have a little too much business, not enough faith. And I'm not talking about how much you put into it. I'm saying the approach. And let's start reading so you understand where I'm coming from. First Chronicles chapter 22. So David gave orders to assemble the aliens living in Israel from them he appointed stone cutters to prepare dressed stone for the building of the house of God. He provided a large amount of iron to make nails for the doors of the gateways and for the fittings, and more rods that could be weighed. He also provided more cedar logs than could be counted. The Sidonians and Tyrians had brought large numbers of them to David. David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced. And the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. Describe David's preparations. 
decorations for the temple. Yes, sir? Most expensive. Most expensive. He goes for the best of the best. We see later that the, the logs of Sidon and Tyre, these are the best. We're going to see Lebanon logs coming down. This is the best in that world. Yeah. Jim, sir? He uh, lined up some of the trade people. I, I got the workers, right? And where does he take the workers from? The aliens. What, how have the aliens been functioning up to this point? Anybody know? They're, they're not native Israelites. They're not slaves. Can you guess what these aliens, not aliens, not green, low, godly men with your fault. They're, they're just people that are not native Israelites living in the land who are not slaves. What kind of jobs would a not native Israelite do? The same thing. These are the laborers. These are the laborers, the migrants, the workers, the farm help, the business help. This is your lower income skilled workers. David takes the business people's workers and he puts them to a church project. I don't care if you're working on your home right now. The carpenters that you need, no, 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 they're going to be working on the church. I mean, think about that as a king. You undercut your economy because you take the workers that everybody else will need and put them to a church. A, a pretty significant business decision, right? So he uses the most expensive stuff. He takes the workers that everyone else would use. Now they're for the church. What else with this preparation for the temple? Okay. Encourage. Yes. Explain. All the. Uh... Cedar Hall, the uh, iron fitting, bronze of uh, bronze. And how much iron? And how much bronze? We don't know. I mean, he takes so much stuff, an overwhelming amount of material. He's not skimping on anything. Right? Ted. Large and ornate, of great magnificence and fame and splendor. Great. Thing. Well, I can show it off to the world. I'm going to build a church that everyone will talk about. Right? I, I've, I've been part of three building projects. Did I ever hear people talk about a church saying, we're going to build a church people are going to talk about? I haven't. I hear people say we're going to build something that's simple, something that's good, something that's basic, something that works for us. I'm not picking on it. I'm just saying David's goal is to build the absolute best with all of the workers and let the economy go, let the things go, let my personal money go. Oh, you need bronze to build some more buildings? Sorry, all that's going to the church account. In, in a way, he puts his economy on hold for God's church. Yeah. So I think it's interesting. Is what, what if this was going on now? What would people say about us? What would people say about that church period? When's the last time America put his economy on hold for a project? World War II, right? World War II. When everybody said that hey, we're all getting in line, you know, you, you, you look, we're kind of ramping up before Pearl Harbor, after Pearl Harbor, <coughs> Congress makes a declaration, bam, everything is Pittsburgh, everybody, Mills, everything is going for the war effort. And if you read, how did people feel in World War II having their food rationed, and their clothing rationed, and their stuff rationed, and the, and the sugar rationed, victory guards, how did people like that? They didn't, did they, Christine? I was going to say, patriotic people. When you, when you read, right, the propaganda that we did, we're, we're, we're going to, you know, step on a, a crack to break Hitler's back, right? All the stuff that we said that was so important, but you had to have the whole nation behind it, and the people had to sacrifice their personal luxury so we could get into the war and turn the tide. That's what David's doing here. He is taking the workers. He is taking the income. 
He is taking the basic building block materials of their ancient society, and he is taking them all, not for war. He doesn't want war. He's taking it for the church. And the, and the closest parallel, I, I think it was my World War II, that's the closest parallel I can come to our nation. Patriotic people enjoyed it. How do you think the nation felt? I mean, just, just to think about that for a moment. This is a wholesale commitment to making the temple, and everybody is going to sacrifice for great fame and splendor.
gathered together. We had a place in Gibeon, we had a place in Jerusalem, we had a high place, and all that goes away. This is where we come together. And next week, we're going to look at when the entire nation is amassed together and praising God. This is one of the coolest things I think in the whole Bible. I mean, Jesus' birth and death and resurrection, that's pretty cool. But, but, but the, the vision of millions of people standing and praising God together as this golden temple is made to his glory. And his glory is so powerful that it pushes people out of his house and you can't come in until God says it's time. Like that, that, that visual display of pure worship and also mighty power. I, it's a really cool story we don't think enough about. So I do think it's a unification. We're all kind of disparate nations. This is our temple. This is our center. This is our people. And then the way that God shows his thankfulness. Um, thankfulness. God's not thankful. Sorry. To, to track that from your minds. The way that God is pleased with what we have done. Um, that's a distinguishing. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of practical aspects, but it's just cool to see God being pleased by these things. <laughs> there's a lot of the same concept going on today. In a different way. In a different way. God is pleased when we come into his house and worship him. His glory is present to you. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of connections here. Other thoughts come. Um, get a massive project, great, fame, slender, a lot of money. Whole nation's economy for a church. Question number two. My previous church was built in 1871 with red Menominee brick. Red Cedar Menominee Laws, actually this, if you notice the different kind of what this is, people have made this for me out of Red Cedar Logs from 1871 when I renovated the church. It's got a unique smell to it, and uh, it's only in that area. Massive organ, vaulted ceilings, a steeple you could see from another county. All at great expense. It was paid in full before its dedication. As we worked with building consultants to renovate the building, they looked around and lamented, we don't build churches like we used to. What did they mean by that? That we hear that a lot, not just churches, but buildings in general. Yeah. Quality of that. Well, how the big things go up. Why is it that way? Um, so they're not using this as a material possibly. Um, also, the design. And when, when I when I heard you read that, I thought about Mark Luther. Look at the indulgences to build St. Peter's and the Silicon. Right. Then, okay, now, you know, they were, what they were telling the people was something different as far right. as, you know, they were the sins of your dead loved ones. Okay. But also I'm saying it's all about the name for me. I know that when we were in Germany, a lot of the Catholic churches, especially the Protestant churches, you didn't see that. Um, ornate, ornate, and extremely, extremely expensive. Right? So right. I just think it goes back to a lot of it's the design and the type of stuff. And if we had to want a lot of this ornate stuff nowadays, it would be extremely, extremely expensive. And not affordable. Well, this is 1871. Right. Have you ever heard the legend of Paul Bunyan? That's where the legend of Paul Bunyan comes from, is this particular area. This is a logging community with ramshackle houses. And they built, because you can see some of the original houses, and they built a church with their best brick, with their best logs, at a time when, how high can you go? The steeple is visible from another county. The church is probably three times this interior space in 1871. And it's painted full before they have the first service. What does that say about the people in the Nominee of 1871 and Heather? They honor God, bless the hand, giving the first fruits to God. They honor God, giving him the first fruits, yes. Okay. Well, it, it took a lot more manpower. Yes. So people had to give time and skills and, you know, I've read some books about just how builders even built these, you know. More of the high high and neat, and yes, they, they would see if this will, you know, make this, how high can we go? Right. You know, like to get to the highest. Yeah, it's just a craftsmanship, and uh, but I think people probably, and they, even in 1871, you, you had hundreds of people out there on those jobs, <laughs> putting it together. Right. Jim, follow up with that's interesting that um, that's only like six years
so what was the state of the country at that point that they could have it paid off before the dedication? You think about what the state of the country, here in Reconstruction, here in Tennessee, what that was. Up north is just logging country. How many people have disposable income? You don't have that money. You have to. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bricklayer, so I'm going to lay bricks to the glory of God. I'm a logger, so I'm going to cut down these trees. I'm a carpenter. This is all our stuff. We don't have money. We have materials. And so we're going to build the biggest and the best for God's glory, which is what it says on the side of the uh, in there, right? Yeah, think about that time frame yeah. and that community support. Yeah. Um, Ken, and then I think I said someone else. Do you think those people that are dedicated to utilize their ornate craftsmanship to the best of their ability? Really see the 
generosity of David to give to the Lord. Comments on this? Yeah. You know, I've read this many times, and I always wonder, when you talk about these quantities that can't be counted, can't be weighed, how do you even store something like that thousands of years ago? What do you do with it? Lost to history. There's some of the things in that area where you can see, like, we know that Joseph made certain granaries in Egypt, and we have some of those extant records. In fact, they just found one last year where they found what, what very much seems to be a, 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 a granary that he saved up. So we have some of that, you know, but some of these things, it's like, where did all the money? Did they just have piles of gold outside with soldiers? You don't know? That's what I wonder. Because, I mean, I can see a grain reader to store your food. Fine. Yeah. In this day and age, you don't need this laying around. This is a vault. <laughs> right. How big was the vault in Davis to yeah. hold on to his money? Bigger than Scrooge McDuck? <laughs> <laughs> Did he swim in it? Good. Another thought on David's wealth that he gives freely to the Lord. Uh, let's take a look. How does, how does David describe his giving? It says it took great pain. Great pain. Should that be our stewardship uh, plan for 2020, Byron? Great pain is for the Lord. <laughs> do, we, do we ever talk about our giving as great pain? Give till it hurts, right? I'm not, I'm not making, I'm not telling you to give till it hurts. And not what I'm saying. I'm just saying sit for a moment and think about David's faith. All the ups and downs, all the foolish choices, all the sinful things, but when it came to the Lord, he gave him great pain. It hurt him to do this, but this is what he wanted. It, it, it is, it's an interesting word choice for a multi-millionaire Okay, and, and it's more of a context. I've taken great pains. That doesn't mean it, it hurt. It means you paid careful attention to it. And you, you thought about it, you considered it, you, you spent time on it. Not, not necessarily physical pain, but you spent your time and your attention that's what I thought too. I thought it was kind of that English colloquialism. And then when you actually look at the Hebrew word there, you're getting into this idea of personal pain. You know, I thought this is the man who says, I've been, I've been accounting all of this, and I've been planning all of this. This is the man not using what we would say as a colloquialism. A man saying, I've done that. I mean, obviously, you had it already. But also, it's hurt me personally to do this. Which... To me, that's where I, you always have to read it twice and go back to the original language. Because I thought, we don't talk this way, right? You say, I took great pains to do this. I, it was great pains to save up for this house. Well, that means I have to save everything and do it every month and make sure it's there. That's how we talk, the way he's speaking. It's so, I mean, the whole story is so different from a normal. Um, so yeah, I agree, that's normally what we would think of. And that was my first guess and we read later. Read more to the text, and you see it's that and personal pain. Huh? I don't, I don't think I'm giving a personal pain, right? But he did it away. Ken, would you think that when he finally came to the group, it was like everything he had, God, and you? Well, that's, that's what we start to see here. Right? Before I die, I'm giving it back to the Lord. I, I was just imagining, I, I would think he might have a lot of people opposing his thing. So right. he had to really just stay single, singly focused and say, yes, this is what we're going to do. So he probably had a lot of opposition from other people to what he was doing. Do you think his wives and right. children? Right. I can imagine his kids going, what? No. <laughs> He has a lot of wives and children. We don't know the number of his concubines. We don't know how many descendants. They're all, we're going to find them later. They're all greedy. His cabinet doesn't always agree with him. They try to take a coup with Solomon. I mean, we see opposition over and over. This incredible.
incredible gift. God doesn't recount any opposition, but I feel pretty confident in saying, David, can we do something else? My king, my liege, um, can I have some money? No, no, no. It's all going for God. Uh, a million talents? Can I just have two? No, nope, it's going for God. You've got to expect the opposition. And difficult. And it, it's just a guess. It's a theory. I can't say what. But you see some of the fighting that happens in Solomon and also with some of other Solomon's kids. Um, do people kind of pick up on this? Well, I, I, I don't want to be second in command. I want to be first in command. Because if, if I'm not first, I don't get to say where the money goes. We're kids. We're used to being princes. We're used to being in the palace. We're used to having this. Now he's going to give it all to God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. i got to get in command so I can control the purpose. It's a theory I've heard. I can't say it's true, but when you see this outlandish giving, you have to expect opposition. And maybe it explains some of the greed later. Trying, trying, trying to understand the gift and then also the follow of greed. No. Something possible in your head about being a cheerful giver. <laughs> Here it is. I'm cheerfully taking these steps to give this to God. Here's cheerful giving. So it hurts. How else does David describe his giving? I have taken great pains. What's the other thing he describes his giving? I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. It's a really small sentence, but I think it's really important. Lord be with you. Lord be with you, right? He asks for God's blessing at the end. It's a sentence right in the middle after he lists all the money. It kind of transitions from money into to material resources, and you may add to them. Does it command this son to give? He says, I'm giving this freely. You can join me. And we're going to see the people of God join him. So he takes the lead, he cheerfully gives, <coughs> it's great pain to him, and yet it's an encouragement and you saw them. You may add to the, the massive vault or wherever that is. Of all this money. Page two, let's see. Well, are people going to add? Are people going to give? I mean, there's a million talents of silver lying on the ground. People are going to say, you know, I'm just going to keep my money today because I think we're good. Um, now we get to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is a continuation of the story. This is kind of his first stop. Now we're at the second part. Now I'm going to describe even more giving of David. Beside in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and above everything, I have provided for this holy temple. Let's pause here. The hundred thousand talents of gold, the million talents of silver, where did that money come from? Heather? Personal treasure. Not just his personal treasury, right? Because now he's distinguishing his personal treasury. Now I'm going to give more for my coffers. Where else did that money come from? Taxes? Yeah. This is the people's money. Yeah. I'm taking from the royal treasury, the government's money, and I'm putting that into a building. Your taxes that you pay, your revenue that you give to me, I'm putting into a building. I not only took your people, I not only bankrupted your economy, I not only slowed down your growth, but now I'm taking your revenue and putting it to the building, and I'm going to add my revenue on top. Wholehearted devotion, and might I say, some opposition to you. We'd expect. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a House of Representatives or a Congress at this point, but you would imagine people saying, um, yeah, we just expended the budget for the year. For a building, quite a lot of money. 3,000 talents of gold to roll it over, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings. For the gold work and the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? He's got 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver. Where is that going? It's 
going to cover up the walls. When you walk in, all you will see is gold.
consecrate yourselves, take your normal income, your normal life, and use it for holy purposes, for God's purposes. He doesn't look at giving to the temple, like paying a water bill, or paying an electric bill, or paying a cell phone. Okay, I gotta give, it's another thing. I know I'm supposed to be this much or that. He's saying, you are giving for holy use. Set aside your body, not just your wallet, set aside your wholeness of yourself to give to holy use. Okay? Yeah, no, no, no. This is a safe control. It is. He owned multiple small businesses, and he was so wealthy 
and he gifted land and brand new luxury homes to his children. What did this Bible story reveal about that man's heart? <laughs> Kim? <laughs> Yeah. David 
kept his promises to the Lord to build his temple. And maybe that's the reason why God let him keep his kingship and everything and how he brought the sword into the home. Sure. We know God allowed him to keep his kingship just because God made a promise and he kept it. We will say this, though, that, that God does bless us, and he does want us to use that for others, not just the poor after, not just the spirits we've got to swim around in. So we're careful not to say, well, he had a lot of money at the end, and means that he's a good boy. We, we will say God did bless him richly, more than he deserved, but in the general way, he does bless us to be blessing to others, to give, to serve, whatever. Even if I don't have a lot of money, I don't, you know, if you look at the records of Menominee in 1871, you look at the people who built, they still have those records. These are people who are very poor, who have annual incomes of under $100, but they are dedicating their time to laying brick, which is not fun if you've ever done it. Dedicating their time to laying brick, that brick is still there at the cornerstone when I walk by every Sunday up to the fall. So I, I do think the minds are on a lot of money cash. Well, these people are giving them their time and their talents and their treasures. You know, God makes the most beautiful building on earth because he wants it. He focuses on our giving, I think, to encourage us, to support us. Mike? I think as council members of God, in fact, everything he owns is gift from God. And he was to be thank this is what I think is his grace. It makes it still a blessing for everyone. It, it was very difficult for me as a pastor with one year of experience to confront a council member who could easily be my father and had far more income than I would ever have and say, I think you're greedy. Yeah. We hugged it out eventually, it took a couple months. <laughs> but he saw it finally. Other thoughts on this story? Next week, we're going to look at the wonderful thing of God building his temple and the praise and glory that comes with it. And just that encouragement of how people gave and how we can give as well. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the example of your servant, David. In his many sins, you have forgiven him, and you use him and your people to your glory. Bless us as we give of our time, talents, and treasures to you wholehearted devotion, in generosity and in service. Because you've given us the cross. You've given us heaven. You've given us everything. We are very grateful. Bless us always. Your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.